Thanks, Josh. Thanks, gang. Appreciate it so much. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> By the way, what we were just doing, this isn't in your notes, this is extra. Um, you know when the Bible says to pray without ceasing? A great way to do that is what we were just doing, is to keep a worship song in your heart. Because when you think about what the words are that we're singing, they're all sung prayers. And uh, it's hard to keep yourself speaking prayer continually, but you can always keep a song in your mind and in your heart. It's a great way to pray continually. What I want to talk about uh, today is, uh, is prayer. If you want to take out your message notes, uh, ushers, we still have some empty seats over here, and there's room for folks to come on in. It's good to have all of you. I also want to say hi to everybody who's watching online. Um, wow, we had a great turnout. This is, this is awesome. But as I stood in the back and worshiped with you, I was thinking, man, Lord, look at, look at the hearts of people that are gathered in this place. We want to know how to connect with you. That's why we're here. We want to know how to talk to God. We want to know, how do we know if he hears us? And, and how are we supposed to pray? And I, I really think that it's a lot more simple than we've made it out to be. I mean, when you think about a perfect God, then why would he make communication so difficult? It seems like he'd make it perfectly simple. I think we're the ones who make it so difficult, trying to think, well, what are the right words, and am I supposed to read this prayer that I found online, and are there, you know, incantations and magic formulas? No. When you talk to God, you're talking to your dad. You're talking to a heavenly father who loves you, and he is not at all concerned about eloquence. He just wants honesty. I always like to say what God wants most from you in prayer is you. It's all he's looking for. He just wants you. He wants to communicate with you. And he's given us this wonderful privilege and this marvelous invitation to talk to him and to tell him the things that are on our mind, but also to partner with him in what's on his mind. And that's the main emphasis of prayer that I want to talk about today. I want to talk about things like what is spiritual warfare? How do we pray without ceasing, as I just said? How do we know what to pray? How long to pray? What is our authority in prayer? I want to talk about some of those things. Because oftentimes if you think, you know, you read, okay, there's a seminar on prayer, and you might think, well, that's kind of a no-brainer. And sometimes, not to be disrespectful, but sometimes prayer is a no-brainer. I don't think about what I'm saying. I don't engage my mind and pray deliberately and, and purposefully. And one of the, the biggest complaints that I hear from believers is a, a dissatisfaction with their prayer life. You just know, how, how do I do this? How do I pray? What do I say? And, and really, it, it kind of eventually gets down to the question of, why do we pray anyway? What is that all about? <clears throat> why is it important? And the Bible makes it clear to us that we are in a great cosmic spiritual war. We have a very real spiritual enemy, and God has equipped us, empowered us, authorized us, and called us to partner with him to accomplish his purposes on the earth. And we do it through prayer. And I want to begin by looking at a, an important passage of Scripture that's in the book of Ephesians. It's in your notes. You'll notice that I, I had the notes printed single-sided because in the past when I've done things like this, people said there's not enough room to write notes. So now you've got the back of a page and you can write all the notes you want to or draw pictures or whatever it is you want to do, all right? <clears throat> but I want to start by looking at this, this passage that you're probably all familiar with. That's from Ephesians chapter 6. And to spend a little time to say, well, what does this actually mean for us and how does this relate to our prayer life? And here's what it says. Paul is writing, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So our struggle is not against people. It's a, it's a spiritual battle, he's saying. <clears throat> Therefore, you put on spiritual armor. You put on the full armor of God 
So that when the day of evil comes, notice he doesn't say if, he says when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand then, firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, <clears throat> and having done all of that now, having armed yourself, now he comes to our strategy. He says, and pray. That's the strategy of our spiritual war. You've armed yourself, now, he says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. So what is Paul talking about in this passage? I don't want us to get distracted by the metaphor. It's easy to get distracted by the word picture of a belt and a breastplate and a shield and a sword. We get distracted by that. The armor is not something that you put on every day as though you took it off every night when you went to bed. That's not what it is. What Paul is talking about is how you live your life. That your life is so marked by truth that you are living your life as a saved person, that you are such a person of the word that it's as though you are clothed in these things. He's talking about a lifestyle that these things that he's just listed, faith and truth and righteousness, that they, they mark you, that they're a mark of your character. They define you. You can't just say that you're putting on the armor. You have to live as though it were true of you, that you were covered in these things. So how do you, for example, put on the belt of truth? Well, you do it by living truthfully, by being a person of integrity. How do you put on the, the, the breastplate of righteousness? It's by living like a saved person, living according to God's ways. It's as though it's covering your heart. How do you take up the sword of the Spirit? Well, it's not just by having a Bible on the shelf. You take up the sword of the Spirit by getting into the Word, getting the Word into you, and learning how to apply it, how to use it, learning to understand it, learning how to hear from God as you read it. If you only open your Bible on Sunday morning, and then you don't look at it for the rest of the week, that would be sort of like a, a soldier strapping on his sword when he walked into the mess hall. And then he takes it off when he goes out onto the battlefield. Because the battlefield is what happens all the other days of the week. Paul is saying, live your life as though this is always true of you, that you are a person of prayer. And notice that this whole list of the armor is setting us up for the strategy of how to pray effectively. And we're going to see more of that in just a moment, of how these two things go together. Paul could have, could have used, had he written this today, he could have used a whole other word picture. He could have talked about football here in America. He could have said, you know, the quarterback's got a helmet, and he's got shoulder pads, right? And he's got whatever. If, if, a, if a quarterback goes on the field without his helmet on, well, then he shouldn't be surprised if he gets a head injury. If he's not wearing his cleats, well, then he can only blame himself if he slips and falls. It's the same kind of idea. It's just a different way to look at it. So it's a metaphor, and I, it's so easy to miss the truth because I've heard people in prayer that say, okay, Lord, we're putting on the helmet of salvation and we're putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, frankly, that's just make-believe if you're not living that way. God wants us to live as, as though these things were marks upon our life. They were marks upon our character. So here's what I want you to write down. That the armor of God is not a wish list. It's a checklist. It's not something you wish was happening. It's something that you're going to check up on. It's a checklist. So for example, you might say, the belt. Am I a person of integrity? Check, right? The breastplate. Am I guarding my heart from evil? Check. 
The shoes, am I walking the walk of a saved person? Can people tell by my lifestyle that I follow Jesus? That's what it is to have your feet fitted with the shoes of the gospel of peace. So you would check that off. The shield, am I standing firm in my faith? Check. The helmet, am I thinking like a saved person? Am I thinking the way God wants me to think, according to his values and his ways? Am I thinking with the mind of Christ? Do I have that helmet on? Check. Or how about the sword? Am I truly becoming a man or a woman of the word? Check. It's not a wish list. It's a checklist of things that are already in place. If we only pray to put on the armor, but we don't live as though it were on us, then we're just fooling ourselves. Paul is calling us to a higher way of life. He's calling us to live as people of God, as partners with God in what he is doing on the earth. So you can't just start your day by praying, okay, I'm putting on the armor and I'm going to go live however I want to. Nor can you wait for the, the battle to start and then say, okay, well, now I've got to go in and put on my armor. It's too late by then. I have a... <clears throat> I have a son-in-law who's a, a sheriff. He doesn't put on his uniform and his weapon after the crimes have already started. He's ready from moment one of the day. A soldier doesn't put on his armor and arm himself after the battle's already started. He leaves the tent ready to go because we don't know when, as Paul says, when the day of evil will come. The devil is always at work. He hates us. And so we always have to be ready. So we need to be living a lifestyle of, of readiness. And, and Paul says, having done all of this, watching how you're living your life, being a person of the word, a person of faith, thinking the way God wants you to think about things, not the old way that you like thinking about things, but living by his values. If all of those things are going on, he says, now stand. And when you stand, he says, now you're going to pray. Now you're ready to pray the way God wants us to. And Paul says in verse 13 of that passage, he says, you put on the whole armor. In the New Living Translation, it says, put on every piece of the armor. So for example, you can't say, yeah, I've got my sword, but I don't really need to live by integrity. I don't need to live truthfully. Or you can't say, you know, I've got great faith, but I really don't like to read the Bible. We have to do all of it. He says, put on the whole armor of God, put on every piece of that armor so that we are prepared for what's coming. So that then we can pray. We're not vulnerable anymore. There's no opening. We haven't given the devil an opening in our life. So we're living according to God's ways, living according to his word. The point is, that we're in a battle, and it is a very real battle. And you read about it all throughout Scripture. There are occasions all throughout the Bible when we see how God, there was something happening in a spiritual realm. You read about it in the book of Daniel in chapter 10. You could write that down and look at it later. In uh, Second, uh, Second Kings 6, I believe it is, when Elisha is talking to his servant, and they're facing this huge army, and his servant is scared to death, and God says, and Elisha says to God, open his eyes so he can see. And God opens this man's eyes and he sees this vast angelic army standing behind them. There are occasions like that throughout Scripture where we read about spiritual war. That it isn't, as Paul said, it is not against flesh and blood. It's against spiritual forces of evil who are out to do harm and who are out to thwart whatever it is that God wants to do in the world around us. <clears throat> There is a huge difference between being in a war and being at war. Huge difference. A refugee is in a war, but they're trying to get out of it. A soldier is not only in a war, he's also at war. He's in it to win it. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is my posture in life? Because I'm in a war whether I want to be or not. Paul just told us that. Am I in a war like a refugee doing everything I can to just avoid it? Or am I in it to win it? 
to partner with God to accomplish what God wants to accomplish on the earth. He's calling us into something to partner with him to accomplish his purposes in the world around us. So how do we then fight this battle? What does spiritual warfare look like? Well, Ephesians chapter 6 that we just read tells us that that primary strategy is through prayer. But I want to give you a picture of something. My mentor shared this with me, and it really changed how I approached my prayer life. And I want to share it with you. I'm going to, I'm going to draw a picture. Now, you're about to discover something about Pastor Buddy, <clears throat> and it has to do with my artistic talent. So w- when I was in junior high, seventh grade, I was enrolled in a seventh grade art class. And our, our art teacher, she was, she was kind and well-intended, but a, I think maybe a little delusional. Because she was one of those art teachers who said, you know, there's an artist in every child. We just have to release the artist in the child. <laughs> Three weeks into the art class, <clears throat> she leaned over my shoulder as I was trying to draw something, and she goes, are you sure you wouldn't rather take Spanish? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. <clears throat> anyway, I, I, I want to draw something out here. Because this really helped. I like pictures, right? <clears throat> In 1983, the United States military launched the first ship that was equipped with something called the Aegis radar system. And the Aegis system, okay, here we go. Here's the art. I got to draw a circle. Okay, there we go. So the Aegis system, thank you. That was supposed to be a square. The Aegis system is uh, on a ship. And actually, they don't put it on the ship, they build a ship around it. But the Aegis system is a radar tracking system that can search, track, and destroy over 100 targets on land, sea, under the sea, and in the air. It can launch attacks on all 100 of those targets simultaneously. And it's within a 100 and 15 mile radius. So this is 230 miles from this one ship in this fleet that's equipped with this. That's roughly the distance from San Diego to Santa Barbara. So you think of a ship off sea that's covering, that's watching an area from San Diego to Santa Barbara. It can target, track, search out over 100 targets, 115 mile radius, and at the same time, it can defend the rest of the fleet from incoming attacks from the air, from under the water, and from the sea itself, or from land. And they called it the Aegis system. And I thought that was a fascinating word, Aegis. Many of you know that I like words. I went, okay, what does this mean? What does Aegis mean? Well, first of all, Aegis actually was originally was the name of, uh, goes back to uh, mythology. It was the name of Zeus's shield. It means the shield of God. But the word itself, and I want you to write down this definition because we're going to dig into this a little bit. The word aegis itself means this. It means the realm or reach of authority. Write that down. Authority, influence, protection, responsibility, or advocacy. The realm or reach of authority, influence, protection, responsibility, and advocacy. Put those words back up again. Because I want us to look at that. I want to think about this for a moment. Think about what those words are. The realm, the reach of authority. How far does that influence? How far out does that protection go? What is in that realm of authority and of responsibility, and of advocacy. And what that does is it leads to a question for you to write down. And here's the question. What is the aegis of my prayer life? What is the aegis of my prayer life? What is the extent of the territory that you cover? What has God brought into your life that he is calling you into prayer over? Let me give you some ideas of what's in the Aegis. What are some of the things that you're watching over, protecting, targeting? 
for example, how about your family? You got a family, you got parents, or you got a spouse, you got kids, you got siblings, distant relatives of some kind. How about your family? That's part of the aegis of my prayer life. Or how about your friends? If God has given you friends, you have a divine call, privilege, responsibility to pray for your friends. How about this? How about your church? Praying for your pastor, praying for children's ministry, praying for people who might be coming onto the campus, praying for your church, your community. That's another part. The community includes not only the city that you live in, but it also includes your nation of praying for your government, not just complaining about them, but praying for those people, praying fervently for them. How about this? How about work or school? The people that work with you, your boss, your teachers, your kids' teachers. Do you ever pray for your kids' teachers? Or how about projects and events? That's another thing that's in the the, the aegis of your prayer life. Projects and events, things that you're involved with, opportunities, threats, challenges that are out there on the horizon. You're looking at what is going on in my life and asking, I, when, I st- when I saw that picture, aegis, I thought, okay, what is in my life that I'm not covering, that I'm not paying any attention to, that is then therefore maybe vulnerable to some kind of, of hazard? Jesus says in Matthew 26, he says, watch and pray. And in this passage that we just read from Ephesians 6.18, Paul says, be alert and always keep on praying. It's not enough just to pray vaguely. He says, pay attention. Be alert to what's going on in the world around you and be praying for these things. Be vigilant. Be prayerful. Keep an eye out of what God is doing in the world around you. You see, if we attempt, you think about projects maybe that you're on. Think about things that are going on in this this church or things that are going on in your home or in your business. If we attempt to sail into dangerous waters without the Aegis system of prayer in place and activated in our life, then we risk failure. We risk hazard. And we might wind up going, God, Why did you let this fail? And God will simply say, well, why didn't you ask me to help it succeed? He wants us to be praying. That's why Paul says, in all of these things, be watchful, be alert, and pray for all of these things. Be continually bringing them before God. There is so much at stake when we pray. Eternal lives are at stake. Life on earth is at stake. If you think of the people, you think of the opportunities, you think of the challenges that are going on around you, and ask yourself the question, what could happen if I prayed? Or maybe to look at it in a a more negative light, you could also ask yourself the question, what could happen if I don't pray? There's so much at stake. And God has called us to be, to be praying people. So I come back to that question, what is the aegis of my prayer life? Now, I want to take a moment, and <clears throat> this isn't in the notes. It's something I thought about this afternoon. And talk uh, just for a moment about authority, your authority in prayer. What does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus? Because most of the time when we pray, we're at a meal, or we're praying for a friend, or you're in church, or someone's praying, and at the end of the prayer, they'll say, in Jesus' name, amen, so be it, in Jesus' name. To pray in Jesus' name is not to put a little bow on the package. If you go back to this picture of this, this ship, Aegis, right? So this ship is sailing under a flag of some nation. In our case, because I'm talking about the United States Navy, it sails under the flag of the United States. That means it is sailing in the name of the United States of America. It is coming under the authority. It is doing the business of the United States of America. It represents the United States. In fact, a military ship at sea 
is considered part of a sovereign nation. It is the United States out there on the water. It's under, under someone's, it's coming in the name of its nation that has sent it. To pray in the name of Jesus is like coming underneath his authority and saying, I'm coming because he sent me. I'm praying this way because he's given me the opportunity, the responsibility, the right, and the authority to pray. And so I come in the name of Jesus, under his authority. I'm sailing into these waters in his name, just like that ship might be sailing into dangerous waters in the name of its nation. It's the same idea. That's what it is to have this authority in prayer. We come under his name. We come before the throne of God in his name. We pray against evil in the name of Jesus. We pray for people that we love in the authority of Jesus' name. And all that is represented in who Jesus is, just as that ship comes and represents all that is within that nation itself. So that's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. That's your authority. He didn't just leave us weak and uncovered. Jesus had said, he said, look, all authority has been given to me. He said, now go in my name, pray in my name, touch in my name, speak in my name. We go in the authority that he has given us to do his work in the world around us. So this could be getting more and more complex. So let me see if I can simplify it. How do you actually do this? How do we know, how can I make sure that things in my life are covered? That I'm actually praying for things? All right? So here's some ideas about how to get organized in your prayer life. Let me just give you some practical ideas. Here's the first thing you can do. You can schedule them. Go ahead and schedule them. Put them into a calendar. Some things you're going to pray for daily. Some things you might pray for weekly or monthly. Some things you pray for seasonally. But put it on a calendar to remind yourself to pray for those things. Let me give you an example of some of these seasonal things. There could be a test or a trial or a hardship that either you're going through or some friend of yours is going through that you know on such and such a date at such and such a time, my friend is going to go have this very difficult conversation or they're going in for some kind of an operation or something is happening. You put it on your calendar and say, for this season of time, I'm going to pray at that point. I'm going to schedule it so I don't forget. You know, we say all the time, oh, I'm going to be praying for you. I do that myself. I'm going to be praying for you. I've, I've tried. I'm, I'm working at it. Instead of saying, okay, I'll be praying for you, it's just to stop and pray for him right then. So that way I wasn't lying, okay? And I actually did what I said I was going to do. But I'll also, I'll also put, it, put it on my calendar. Sometimes they are, there might be a, a critical moment that has to be pressed through to accomplish a certain task. For example... Maybe you're going on a peace trip. It's a two-week long trip. So for those two weeks, I'm going to put it on my calendar so that I don't forget that I'm going to pray for my friend who's on a peace trip. i got a friend, one of my dearest friends, a guy named Dave, and every quarter he goes to the Philippines to train pastors. So I put it on my calendar. For every day that he's gone, it's on my calendar. When I look at it in the morning, pray for Dave. He's in the Philippines. So I don't forget. It's simple. You just schedule these things. Um, Sometimes there are things that are, are decisions with far-reaching implications. A job change. You're going to move away. Maybe there's a change coming in a relationship. And so you, you schedule these things out, but it's for a season. And once that season is over, well, then you may not need to pray for it at all. Or maybe it changes into just once a week or so. I, I pray for those things. So you can schedule these things. Another thing you can do is you can set up prayer memorials. That's what I call them. Set up prayer memorials. Let me give an example of what I'm talking about by that. These are, these are physical things that will remind you to pray. <clears throat> My mentor that I was talking about a moment ago, who first explained this Aegis picture to me, I went to visit him. He's a, a great pastor up in the San Fernando Valley. And uh, <clears throat> I went to spend a day with him just a couple years ago. And uh, I was asking him about his prayer life. So he took me out in the front yard of his house. He lives in one of those ranch-style houses up in the San Fernando Valley. So it has a long front yard, kind of private. <clears throat> he took me out in the front, and he goes, 
You see those two pine trees over there? That's Ken and Lauren, two of his best friends. Ken, is it Lauren? Lauren, right? Yeah, it's Ken and Lauren. I'm asking my wife. It's Ken and Lauren. He says, I come out and I go and I stand in front of those trees and I pray for my two, my two best friends in ministry, Ken and Lauren. And then right underneath it was a bench. He said, this is Dean and Lori. And I pray for Dean and Lori when I come over to this bench. And then there were columns along the front of the yard with fence running between them. And he says, so this column over here, this is the church. It's the church that he started. And this one right here, this is the, the university that he had started. And he starts naming what these different columns are. And then right in the center of everything was this beautiful fountain. He said, so the fountain, he said, that's Anna. That's his wife. She said, he said, she's a fountain of life to me. So I see the fountain, I pray for Anna. And then he said, you see that little birch tree over there behind it? He said, that one's you. When I come out in the yard and I come to the birch tree, I pray for you. They're little memorials, reminders of things. So I've begun doing that in my life. I mentioned a moment ago, I have a son-in-law who's a sheriff. I have another son-in-law who's a firefighter. So whenever I see a police car or a sheriff's car, I pray for my son-in-law, Micah. Whenever I see a fire truck, I pray for my son-in-law, Sean. And if I just hear a siren, but I don't see what it is, I pray for both of them. <laughs> They're just little reminders. When I see it, I'm going to pray for them. There may not be anything going on in their life. I have no idea. But what's it going to hurt for me to take just a moment and to pray for Sean and for, and for Micah. So I, I set up these little memorials. There's, there's another one. Um, uh, there's a guy I went to school with <clears throat> since the fourth grade, and I had lost touch with him um, early in high school, reconnected about four years ago. And, and he actually goes to this church. Uh, his name is Eric. But what I noticed was on his Facebook postings for a while, it went on for, I don't know, a few months, that occasionally all he would post was 11-11, He'd write 11, 11. And if you look at the time he posted it, it was 11, 11. And it was like he kept looking at the clock and seeing 11. So he would just say it. He would just post it. And I thought, well, I don't know what's going on in 11, 11. But whenever I see 11, 11, I'm going to pray for Eric. I got to tell you, it happens at least once a week, sometimes two or three times a week, that I just happen to look at the clock either on my laptop or my phone, whatever. It's 11, 11. So I pray for Eric. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on in his life. I haven't told him, hey, send me your prayer request. I just pray for him. These are memorials. They help me organize things that are in the aegis, the realm or reach of my influence, of my authority, of protection, of the things that God has placed in my life. Here's another idea of how you can organize prayer. This is what I call drop-in visitors. Drop-in visitors. Here's what I mean by drop-in visitors. Drop-in visitors are the people who randomly, out of the blue, for no reason whatsoever, just pop into your mind. Ever happen to you? Somebody comes to your mind. Well, I've decided that when that happens, I'm going to pray for those people. Again, what harm is it going to do? It may do something really wonderful. So when someone just pops into my head, I pray for them. And then I pull out my phone. If I've got them in my phone, I look up their number and I send them a text. And it's only four words. Every time it's the same thing. Four words. Praying for you today. That's all I do. It's unbelievable the responses I get from people. How did you know? I got to tell you what's going on. Thank you so much. And I, that's all I do. I just say, I'm praying for you today. And those are drop-in visitors. I've just decided that it's no accident. If God knows that I like to pray and I want to talk to him and that I care about people, well, then bring them on. Let him bring random people into my head. It helps me organize and actually pray for these folks. Look at this verse from 1 Samuel 12. <clears throat> he says, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. It's interesting that it's not just sinning against you sinning against the Lord by failing to pray for you. If God has brought you friends, you have a sovereign obligation to pray for your friends. 
If he's put you in a family, you have a sovereign obligation to pray for your family. If you're in a business, if you're in school, wherever God has placed you, if he put you in a church or a ministry, you have an obligation to pray for that business, that school, that church, that ministry, wherever he's placed you, to pray for these things. He's given us that call to do these things. Now, I know this still can sound overwhelming. How am I supposed to pray for all of these people? I don't have time to pray for all these people. Well, who said you have to have a lot of time? You don't have to pray for all of them for an hour. Not at all. You can actually just mention a person's name in prayer. Paul did it all the time. The Apostle Paul. I'll just show you three verses. There are more. Just three verses in the Scripture. Look what Paul says he did. Ephesians 1.16, he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. 1 Thessalonians 1.2, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. Philemon 1.4, he says, I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers. He says it again, I believe it's Romans, I think it's Romans 1. He says, I just mention." There's, it's, it's not that you need to pray for 25 minutes for everybody that pops into your mind. But when they come into your mind, for example, for me, a, a drop-in visitor, let's say, or my friend Eric at 1111, I'll just say, Lord, you know what's going on in Eric's life today. I pray that you will bless that man's life. Bless his family, watch over him. Whatever it is he needs, just take care of him. That's all. I'm not on my knees travailing in prayer for Eric. It's just a momentary prayer. But it gives me the opportunity to do what God is asking me to do. That he's put these people in my life, situations in my life that I pray for. Now, there are things that I pray for every day. My family I pray for every day. I pray for people on our staff, teams that I work with, by name, every single day. But most of the time, it's just mentioning their name. Unless I know of something that's going on, a project, a challenge of some kind, maybe a health crisis, then I might dig in a little bit. But I'm just mentioning it. But I'm praying for some every day. But there are others, as I said, that they're just seasonal, weekly, monthly, whatever it might be. So you put these things on your calendar. Set an alarm. Do whatever it takes to remind yourself to pray. So it takes a little thought up front. To say, okay, who's in the aegis of my life? Who does God want me to pray for? Am I praying for my family? Am I praying for my wife and my kids or my husband or my, you know, whatever, my folks? Am I praying for them? Am I praying for the people I work with? Am I praying for friends at school? Just to organize that a little bit and and to, to to bring them to mind so that then you can mention them before the Lord. Now, let me talk about persistence in prayer. How long should we pray? How many times do we need to pray? Because I've actually heard people say before, if you ask God for something more than once, well, then that means you didn't have faith. Uh, There are people who believe that. That's simply not biblical. Look at this verse from Matthew 7, verse 7. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Look at that. Look at that. Do you notice that he doesn't say when? In fact, what he says, each of those words, ask, seek, and knock, is in what, what's called the progressive present tense. What it literally means is this. Ask and keep on asking. And it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. He's telling us it's a continual thing. You keep asking, you keep knocking, you keep seeking until the prayer is answered. So how long do you do that? Well, I pray until the Lord answers the prayer or until I feel some release from having to pray for it any longer. I want to give you some ideas of, of that, uh, how it's happened in my own life. When I was uh, in the eighth grade, I had a best friend who lived 
in Northern California. I used to live in Northern Cal. We moved to Southern Cal, but my friend was still in Northern California. And <clears throat> he was a year ahead of me in school. And my friend started getting into stuff he shouldn't have gotten himself into. He was smoking dope, and then he started selling dope, and he was just going in the wrong direction. And I, I loved my friend, and so I would pray for him. At night before I went to bed, I would pray for my friend, and I prayed for him every day. And this went on for two years. I prayed for my friend that Jesus would get a grip on my friend's life. Now, of course, this is before cell phones and before emails and all that stuff, so everything is, you know, writing letters. Well, we'd write letters back and forth, and some of his letters were really kind of gross, you know. But there was this one day, <clears throat> I went down to our mailbox, walked down the long driveway, went to the mailbox, pulled out on the mail, I saw an envelope, it was from my friend, and when I looked at the envelope, I knew something had happened. Just by looking at his writing on the envelope, I could tell something had changed. And when I opened that letter, and I read that letter, sure enough, he had gone to a church camp and had given his life to Jesus and had sworn off all of that stuff. He's now in ministry. Now, I prayed for this guy every day for two, two years. Was I the only one praying? No. I mean, certainly his mom was, right? At least she was. There had to be other people who were praying for my friend. Which prayer made the difference? Who knows? The point was, I just prayed until something changed. And we don't know when the change will come. We have no guarantees. Well, if you pray this many times in this many ways, uh, you know, you pray until there's a breakthrough. And we don't always know when that's going to happen. And I was trying to think of another word picture, right? Another kind of thing, because I, I like pictures. And I, I remembered, uh, and I'm going to show you something here in a minute, an illustration of, of, uh, of this idea, of this persistence. Um, <clears throat> until about two years ago when I finally smartened up, I used to do uh, the, the, the uh, maintenance work on, my, on the pool at our house. <clears throat> we have this pool at our house. It's one of those artificial rock pools, you know, it's really, really beautiful, but it is just awful to try to take care of. I call it the Zsa Zsa Gabor pool, because it's beautiful to look at, but it's really high maintenance, okay? <laughs> but so from, I remember this test I used to do on the water from years ago, and I, so I want to show it to you, um, and I hope it works. It worked at home, but it's, it's, a, it's this idea of, of things changing in a moment. So I'm going to put a little pool. This is water from my pool that somebody else is now caring for. And I'm going to, there we go. So I'm going to put this in here. And then uh, I'm going to put in a drop of this. One. And then I'm going to put in two drops of this. This is cool. You're going to like this. I'm going to put in the two drops here. Hard to do this without my glasses on. There's two. Okay. So then you mix that up, and it's got this really pretty kind of blue violet color. Can you see that? Can you see this kind of blue? Sort of kind of? I know we got some bad glare on there, but you get the picture. So then what's going to happen is this other stuff, this is kind of like prayer. I'm going to drop this in one drop at a time. We're going to count. And at some point, the water is going to go clear. All right? So we'll put in one i got to put my glasses on or I'm going to mess this up. <laughs> and then you'll all be laughing at me and talking about me behind my back and all this stuff. Okay, here we go. So, we're going to count, and we're going to see when the water changes color. There's one. You're going to mix it a little bit. Two. Still violet. Three. All right? Four. Five. I told you it worked at home. <laughs> Six, seven went in. Eight, 20. <laughs> nine. Okay? Water's clear at nine. Okay, now here's my question <clears throat> Which drop turned it clear? All of them. Right? 
What would happen if I left out the fifth drop? It would still be violet. If I had skipped three and four, I just get on to nine. All of them. You don't know in your prayer life, as you pray, a drop, you pray, a drop, you pray, a drop, and at some point in time, bam, everything changes permanently. You don't know when that's going to happen, but you have to faithfully come back and put one more drop in that water. It's one more prayer for that lost person. It's one more prayer for my sick friend. It's one more prayer for my friend who's out of work or my financial need or for, for whatever's going on in my kid's life. Just like my friend in Northern California, it's one more day I'm praying for my friend. And then, bam, all of it changes permanently. It's the persistence. It's the ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. How often do we give up too soon? Oh, I asked God and he didn't do anything. You need just one more drop. What if just one more drop would have made the difference? There's persistence that we're called to in our prayer life. So we pray with persistence. That's what Jesus means when he says ask and keep on asking. Now I want to talk about the kind of prayer that is most effective. And I'm going to get into a little word study here, but I think, it'll, I think it'll make sense to you, okay? The kind of prayer that is most effective. The book of James tells us this. In chapter 5, verse 16, the Bible says, it's the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I wanted to know what that meant. So I did some word study, and I put all of it in your notes, so there aren't, there's not stuff to fill in, but I want us to look at this, because I think it's important. It helps us, helps us sort of open up what this scripture means. The word righteous, it's the Greek word dikaios, and it means upright, observing divine laws, or living according to the word. It goes back to having the sword of the Spirit. It means that righteous person is a person, it describes a person whose ways of thinking, feeling, and acting is wholly conformed to the word of God and to the will of God. That's what it is to be a righteous person in this text. It's a person who says, not only have I read the word, I'm living that way. So the prayer of a person of the word is powerful and effective. Now, to be the person of the word, God isn't looking for perfection in this. He just wants to know, are you heading in the right direction? In order to live according to the word, then we have to be people who know the word. The word of God will teach you how to pray according to the will of God. Remember, I've said this so many times to our congregation, that the Bible doesn't just tell us the things God said. It tells us how he thinks. And so the more you know the Word of God, the better you understand the mind of God. That great question, what would Jesus do? Well, you'll probably find an answer somewhere here in the Scripture. Because the, it's like any friendship, the longer you talk with someone, well, then the better you understand how they think. So when a question comes up or a decision comes up and you go, well, I wonder what they'd think. Well, you kind of know because you know them. You've talked to them long enough. It's the same way as you're in the Word, the more you know the Word of God, the better you know the will of God, and then it teaches you how to pray according to God's will, because you're praying according to His Word. So that word righteous means it's someone who is thinking, living, and acting according to God's Word. That's why we need to be people of the Word, living as though there's a sword of the Spirit in our hands. How about the word powerful? The word powerful is the word energeo, and it means energized by the power of God. Whenever you see or find the word energeo in the scripture, it always refers to divine power. It never refers to human power. It, so it does not mean human emotion. Now, the King James Bible says it's the fervent prayer of a righteous person. So we think, well, I've got to be emotional about it. It's not talking about human emotion. Although... The power of God can draw out human emotion, but human emotion is never a substitute for divine power. It says it's the, the prayer of a person of the word is energized by the power of God. 
That's what that means. When you live by the word of God, your prayer is infused with the power of God. And then that last word, effective. The word is, is, um, is powerful and effective. The word effective, iskuo, uh, in Greek, it means to be a force capable of extraordinary deeds. Wouldn't it be incredible to know that your prayer was capable of extraordinary deeds? Not just the ordinary, but really extraordinary things would happen when you prayed? Well, here he's telling you how to pray that way. So therefore, if you put all this together, we're going to fill in some blanks here, all right? So write this down. It's the, it means the prayer of a man or woman of the word, the prayer of a man or woman of the word, is energized by the power of God and is a great force capable of extraordinary deeds. That's the prayer that's most effective. The prayer of a man or woman in the word is energized by the power of God and is a great force capable of extraordinary deeds. What this means is that the more I pay attention to God's word, the more he pays attention to mine. In fact, you can write this down. The more I honor God's word, the more God honors my prayer. If you want your prayers to be powerful and effective, if you want your prayer life to be a great force capable of extraordinary deeds, then be sure that your life and your prayers are aligned with the truth of God's word. He has shown us what his will is in his word. And if we pray according to his word and live according to his word, it makes our prayers all that much more powerful and effective because then they are energized by the power of God. When you pray according to the will of God, your prayer is energized by the power of God. The prayer of a man or woman of the word is energized by the power of God and is a great force capable of extraordinary deeds. So here's what I want us to do. We're doing good on time. Anybody here have a cell phone? I want you to practice what I just preached. Pull out your cell phone. And while you're pulling it out, think of someone you know who needs prayer today. Family member, friend, whatever, somebody who's in your phone. You know, there's something going on in their life. Just think of somebody who needs prayer in their life today. You got them? Got them in your mind? Look them up on your phone. I wish it was 1111, but maybe I'll send it to Eric anyway. Okay? You're going to look up your friend, and you're going to send him a text. First, we're going to take 15 seconds, 20 seconds. And just pray for your friend right now. Okay, go ahead. Just pray for him right now. Whatever is going on. Take a few seconds. Okay. Now, send him a text. Four words. Praying for you tonight. Just send him that text. And we'll see what happens in the next few minutes. All right? Send them the text. Praying for you tonight. I don't know what happened, but it must have been good. <laughs> Maybe people are sending them back and forth up in the, <clears throat> in the seats. Um, by the way, I, I wanted to, to let you know that this event... Um, If there's someone that you knew who wanted to be here or somebody who maybe this would be helpful for, uh, this can be watched online starting tonight. Uh, If you go to, I think we have it here on the screen, if you go to saddleback.com slash power of prayer, it will be available uh, starting tonight and you'll be able to send your friends there to to watch this. But I want to kind of turn our direction now and I want to spend a few minutes actually praying. If we go back to the aegis of prayer, and one of those areas that's in your life is the church. You all know that in a week and a half is Easter. Easter is the biggest attendance uh, for the whole year in a church, in any church. Easter is always the biggest. And it's an opportunity 
for people to meet Jesus. And there's a lot that's going to be happening in all of our campuses here in California and all over, all over the world in four continents. And we need to be praying for what God wants to do through Saddleback Church for Easter. And so I figured, well, I got a room full of people who have a heart for prayer or they wouldn't be here. So I want us to take a few minutes and pray together. Now, it's not going to hurt. It might be a little unusual because I'm going to have us pray with one another. All right? So here's what I would like for you to do. I want you to just stand and form groups of four. Okay? Stand and form groups of four. Not nine, not six, not two. <laughs> groups of four. The people around you. Okay? And when you get in your group of four, <clears throat> everybody count off. One, two, three, or four. Take a number. I know this is a math problem. We got it? We got some groups of four? <clears throat> if there's a five, don't worry about it. If there's a three, somebody's going to pray twice. Okay? We got it? We good? All right, so here's what I want you to do. Everybody, you took a number? Okay, look here up here on the screen. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give each of you one minute, which can be a long time, but one minute. And so here's the first round we're going to do. Is whoever, whoever is number one, you need to pray for Pastor Rick. Pray for his sermon preparation, that God gives him the word of the Lord for people who are coming onto these campuses, that they'll meet Jesus. So pray for his sermon preparation. And while you're praying for that, pray for his health and his strength. It's a hard work to do what he does. And pray for his family, because you don't want any distractions of someone getting sick or an accident or anything. So we need to pray for Pastor Rick. Then the person who's number two, if you're on another campus, if you're not part of Lake Forest, pray for your campus pastor. But also, all of the number two folks, pray for your worship team. Pray that God will be glorified by the music, that people will be attracted by the songs, that our worship teams will do well, that they'll, you know, stay strong and healthy too. There's a lot of services that they're doing. Uh, the third person, pray for unbelievers, that they'll come, that God will begin to prepare hearts right now for what's going to happen when they come and hear the message. And then the fourth person, Pray for Saddleback Kids. Did you know that Saddleback Kids at Lake Forest, just on its own, is considered a mega church? It is. There's 2,500 little kids that come to church as Saddleback Kids, all right? It's a mega church. And all of our campuses, there are children's ministry. I gave my life to Jesus when I was six. There are a lot of kids that get saved when they're young. So we need to pray for the teachers, pray for the kids. Let's pray for these children. So I'm going to turn you loose in a moment. I'm going to time you, and after a minute, I'll say, okay, number two, you start praying. So these are short prayers. We're not going for 10 minutes of time. And then uh, the worship team will start take us into a little chorus to let us know, okay, we're done. And then I'll give you your next assignment, all right? So go ahead, form your groups. Person number one, why don't you start praying now for Pastor Rick.
All right, person number two, time to start praying for our campus pastors and our worship teams. Number three, start praying for unbelievers, that they'll come, that they'll hear, they'll see, and they'll surrender their lives to Christ. Number four, start praying for Saddleback Kids, for the teachers and the children. Okay, we'll go to round two. Person number one. You don't have to understand what they do, but they need prayer. Trust me, I know these people. Sound, lighting, video, and facilities. Because here's the thing. If the sound goes down, nobody can hear the gospel, right? If lighting, if video goes, goes weird, it becomes a distraction from what people need to hear. So let's pray for those teams, sound, lighting, video, and the facilities team that will make it a comfortable place for people to gather. Pray that way for whatever campus you go to or here for Lake Forest. The second person, you're going to pray for our volunteers. There are hundreds of them who are involved in pulling off these services. Our ushers, our greeters, our medical uh, volunteers. And, uh, and the traffic coordinators. You know Easter Sunday can, you can lose your salvation here on Easter Sunday <laughs> out in the parking lot. So, so, so those traffic people, you know, they got the tire tread on their back and there's a reason for that. They need prayer for patience, for favor, right? Pray for those folks. Number three, we need to pray for protection of our campuses. Pray for the security of our campuses. There are a lot of people out there who hate what we do and would want to disrupt what happens in our campuses around the world. So let's pray for the security and protection of our churches. And then number four, on, on uh, Easter Sunday here in Lake Forest, we're launching our 18th campus. It's here at this campus, but it's Saddleback Espanol. 
Here in, yeah, yeah. And I'm so glad we're doing it. Here in Lake Forest alone, nearly 35% of the people who live in Lake Forest speak Spanish. It's an enormous harvest field waiting. A huge group of people that need to know the love of Jesus. And so we're opening Saddleback in Espanol. So let's, number four, you get to pray for the startup of Saddleback. Pray that people will come. They won't be afraid of coming on this big campus, that we'll reach them, and that it'll be successful. So those are the four things, all right? Number one, ready? You're gonna pray for the sound, lighting, video, and facilities. Go ahead. All right, number two, begin praying for our volunteers, ushers, greeters, our medical folks, and our traffic ministry. Pray for the volunteers. And number three, begin praying for the security and protection of our campuses. And number four, pray for Saddleback in Espanol.
for our third round. <laughs> it's the last round. You're going to pray for each other. And I'm sure that there are a lot of folks who came here tonight because you've got something going on in your life that you would love to be prayed for. And I, I, I don't want to be insensitive to you. We need to be sensitive to time and what's going on here in the room. So I would want to just ask you to think about this. If there's something going on in your life or someone, some burden on your heart, think for a moment about how would you share that need in about 10 seconds. We don't have 10 minutes for each of us to share because we're only going to take just a few minutes to pray for one another. Maybe you just say, you know, I, I got a kid who's getting into some trouble. I'd, I'd appreciate it if you'd pray for my kid. That I'll be a good parent and God will show me what to do. Rather than, you don't have to tell the whole story. Maybe you're having a, a health crisis of some kind. You know, just pray. I'm, I'm going in for surgery next week or and whatever it is, you know, pray that God will be with me. Just a simple request like that. If you just think of what that might be, get each other's names and then just take a, a few minutes. You know, when we started the prayer garden ministry here at the church, that's up on the, on the patio, we have it now on all of our campuses. We started the prayer garden because I knew that there were people who were coming on our campuses carrying burdens on their shoulders when they walked in the door and at the end of the service they were turning around and carrying the same burden home with them. They hadn't had a chance to unburden their soul, to let God hear from them. And the second reason that we started that was because Rick always says he wants Saddleback to be known as a place where people are loved. And I don't know of a better way to let somebody know that you love them than to take a minute and pray for them. It really is about loving. The, a, a pastor friend of mine shared with me years ago his hesitation to pray for people. He said, I, I sometimes hesitate to pray because I don't want him to be disappointed if it doesn't happen. And, am I setting God up for failure? I mean, all of this stuff was going on in his mind. And his mentor said to him, he said, James, the answer to your prayer is none of your business. <laughs> he said, you pray for people because you love them and because Jesus tells us to pray. So let's love each other. And we're going to take just the next four or five minutes and then the song will start up and just very briefly share what's on your heart and we'll pray Maybe just one person prays for the next one. We don't all pray for the same person. Got it? That makes sense? Let's just take a few minutes and pray together, all right?
Why don't you all take a seat? I want to bring Pastor Rob Jacobs back up. For those of you who arrived late, may not know Rob. Rob is our maturity pastor, the 201 pastor here uh, at uh, Lake Forest. And we're going to do a little, he want to do a little Q&A here for a few minutes. We still got some time. You all doing okay? Yeah? Good. All right. Isn't prayer a good thing? I'm sorry, what? I don't know. What's the last fill in? <laughs> Let me see. What does it say? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Before we get in the Q&A. So my the first last, question is, what's the last fill in? The last fill in. That's your first question. When, when I, all this talk about the righteous person and living according to God's word and living like you're armed, Right? I am not talking about, and here's how I want to make it clear, I am not earning God's favor. I am welcoming His favor. Big difference. That's the last fill-in. I'm not earning His favor. I'm welcoming His favor. I'm making myself available and saying, God, if you're going to bless somebody, hey, I'm blessable. I'm living a life that you're looking for. So that's what it means. All right. Is that good? Okay. Thank you. I totally forgot that one. Obviously. So, uh, buddy, you talked about the idea of checklists, and it brought to mind, um, you know, this is a season of Lent, and one of the things that I've been doing is trying to set down fear. And someone, a very smart person, told me, well, if you set something down, pick something up. So I've been picking up, and I was buddy, by the way, uh, so I've been picking up prayers of faith, hope, and love. Uh-huh. So there, it's a framework, really, I've been using. So, and I've heard you talk about this idea of a framework in the way that Jesus prayed. Why, yeah. why don't you talk about that a little bit, the idea of a framework? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, if you want to be like Jesus, well, part of being like Jesus, I think, is learning how Jesus prayed. If I want to be like Jesus, I should know how he prayed. And so, you know, in Matthew 6, when he gives us what we call the Lord's Prayer, and he says, well, this is how to pray. Because his, his, uh, it's also in Luke, because his his, um, disciples had come and said, Lord, teach us, how do you do this? How do you pray? And he said, well, here's how. He did not say, here's what to pray. So again, it's not, okay, follow this formula word for word and all your dreams will come true. He's giving us a format for prayer. And so he begins in the Lord's Prayer, and he says, we all know the words, our Father who art in heaven, how, I love to say it in the King James, something about the King James, it just doesn't sound right if it's not in the King James. Our (laughs) Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let your name be glorified, is what he's saying. That's the beginning. So he starts with praise. Prayer begins with praise. Father in heaven, I haven't asked for anything yet, I'm just saying I want your name to be glorified. Hallowed be your name. The next thing he says is, your kingdom come and your will be done. That is surrender. I'm surrendering to your sovereignty. I'm surrendering to your wisdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So he starts with praise and then he goes to surrender. He still hasn't asked for anything. Then he comes to what you would call petition or requests. Give us this day our daily bread. 
Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So I'm praying, God, meet my needs, forgive my sins, lead me, guide me, protect me. That, now I've made my request to God. That's the third thing that happens. The fourth thing that happens in the format is he goes back to surrender. He says, for yours is the kingdom. It's just like he said in the beginning, so your kingdom come. And yours is the power, so let's do things your way. Your will be done. It's the, he's gone back where he started to surrender. And then he ends where he began. And yours is the glory forever. Let your name be glorified. Hallowed be your name. So there's a format. If you wrote it down, <clears throat> it's praise, surrender, petition, surrender, praise. And if you think about this, you realize that all of my requests, when I come to God, that all of the requests are in the context of surrender. That I've made my request. I've said, Lord, here's what's going on in my life. I have these needs. I have these desires. There are people that I care about. I make my requests. But ultimately, Lord, I'm saying, but I want your will to be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done, because yours is the kingdom and yours is the power. So all of my requests are in the context of surrender, and all of that surrender is in the context of praise, that whatever happens, ultimately, I want your name to be glorified. The ultimate aim and purpose of prayer is that the name of the Lord is glorified. Whatever that takes... Whatever will bring glory to God. That's how Jesus teaches us to pray. Yes, we make our requests. We make our case before God. But then we say, but Lord, I've told you what I want. But I'm telling you, I really want what you want. Because ultimately, I want you to be glorified however this turns, it, turns out, whatever happens. So that's the format that I, that I pray by. I start every prayer. I, it's, again, it's a habit. I, you could ask my family. You could ask people I work with. You, you might have even noticed it in a worship service when I'm, when I'm preaching and I pray. I always begin prayer with thanks. Always. Before I ask for anything, I always start by saying, Lord, I want to thank you. I always begin with prayer because that's what Jesus is saying. Father in heaven, let your name be glorified. So prayer begins with praise. And then I always end it with saying thank you again. Mm, that's helpful. I like the idea of, of, of bringing glory to God. <clears throat> you talked about the idea of a warrior is in it to win it. Yeah. And the glory going to God there. But what, what about those times when God says no or just doesn't say anything? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. how do we, what's your wisdom there to share with us on that? That's, uh, that's probably the big, the big question in the room. What happens when God doesn't answer my prayer the way I wanted him to? What happens when God says no? And I have to go back to Scripture on that. Um, there are two, two people that come to mind who God said no to and how they responded. So if you look at... Um, if you look at the life of Job, we all know Job's story, right? Where in a single day, well, first it says that Job was this righteous man, lived according to the word of God. He was a righteous man, and it says, and he prayed for his family every day. Every single day he was praying for his family. But in one day, all of his kids were murdered. He lost all of his property, all of his wealth, and he got sick, almost to death, in one day. So here's a guy who's praying for his family, and this happens. And you go, so what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do, what am I supposed to think when children die? Or when a spouse walks out the door? Or when my business goes feet up? What am I left to believe? Is, is faith, uh, is it a hoax? Is God teasing us? Is he pulling my leg? Is he mad at me? What, 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 what do we do? So I go back to Job. 
And when we read his story, remember his wife. His wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? And I got to tell you, growing up in church, I've heard a lot of sermons about Job's wife. (laughs) And I've heard a lot of sermons that made me angry, not at her, at the preacher. Those were her kids. That was her house. That was her property. That's her husband. I understand her. And I am not about to judge Job's wife for her response. It wasn't the right response, but I get it. Because I think a lot of us respond the same way. Or people we know say, hey, well, what, what good is that prayer doing you? But the Bible says Job, his response was, look, I didn't bring anything into the world and I'm not taking anything out. He said, may the name of the Lord be glorified. Just like Jesus taught us to pray. And the Bible says that in all of his discussion of what was going on, it says he never sinned by accusing God of anything. The other person I think of when God said no was Jesus. Remember, when Jesus is in the garden, which is going to be a week from tonight, when we celebrate Monday Thursday, which is the day of the first communion, and Jesus goes into the garden of Gethsemane, it's a week from tonight. Jesus is in the garden, and he's crying out to God, and he is so afraid of what's about to happen to his body He's so desperate to get out of what's about to happen to him that he's actually sweating blood. That's how emotionally charged his prayer was. And he's saying, Father, there's got to be some other way. He says, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Remember that? He's saying, I don't want to do this. Because he knows what it's going to be like. He said, there's got to be something else. Please. Please. Is there some other way? And then he says, but nevertheless, let your will be done. Not my will, but your will. Jesus practiced what he preached. He presented his request to God, and he said, but nevertheless, let your will be done. And then when he goes to the cross, and he's hanging on a cross, dying, and he cries out a prayer to God. And it's the only time in Scripture when Jesus refers to God as by any name but Father. In every other occasion, he refers to him as Father. On this occasion, he says, my God, why have you left me? Everybody else has left me. Why have you abandoned me? And isn't that how we feel when God says no? When he doesn't answer our prayer, we think, well, he's left me. He's abandoned me. And we're going, God, why did you let this happen? Why aren't you doing something? Don't you care? That's what Jesus is saying. My God, why have you forsaken me? But those aren't his last words. Jesus' final words were, Father, you who have abandoned me, Father, you who are not here right now, I can't see you. I don't feel you. The first time in my life, I don't sense that you're with me. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's Jesus' ultimate statement of faith. And the comfort that I take in that, when when God says no, is that Jesus, who sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for me, Jesus knows what it's like to pray to a God who said no. He knows what it feels like. He knows that same desperation that we feel when God doesn't answer our prayer the way we want him to answer. But if you think about God's no answer to Jesus, his no to Jesus was a resounding yes to all the rest of us. 
because we needed a Savior. And there are times when we do not understand God's answer. And you know the old cliche, when you cannot trust the Father's hand, you've got to trust His heart. When what He's doing doesn't make sense, you have to say, I don't get it, but I'm going to trust you. And that's how Jesus teaches us to pray. I'm making my request. God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, surrender. Let your will be done. Because ultimately what he's looking for is the glory of God. I believe that's what the word teaches us about how do we hang on to our faith when God says no. You know, I look at my son and he is an answer to... He's, he, he was uh, adopted... And hmm. all those prayers that were a no, and yet I look at him and said, the, the glory of God and my son, and wow. he, it was a no. Yeah. And, it, and if I go back to the other side of things, you know, we're, we're talking about, okay, when God says no or when he's, he's silent, what about when he answers the prayer before you even ask? And I think you, you brought this up to me one time, and it made me think, I was in the doctor's office one time meeting with my cancer doctor, and uh, he was like, you know, and this is, I'm thankfully past that but he's like you know people who used to get your kind of cancer they just died and I thought thank you doctor well, that's God, comforting God answered that prayer before I prayed it years before I prayed it God had already answered the prayer before I knew I needed to pray it uh -huh. and so just you know how God can even work in, in that way it's just um, you know it's amazing. you know th there's a there's a picture of that in in scripture um, in Genesis with Abraham's life when God provided the ram in the thicket so that he didn't have to kill Isaac. And, God's, and, and Abraham gives God a new name. That's where we get Jehovah Jireh, so the Lord who provides. What it literally means is the one who sees to the need. He sees ahead. Because God had provided the answer to Abraham's prayer by putting that ram in that bush before Abraham ever arrived on the scene. It's the same thing. Sometimes God answers prayers before we even pray them. Yeah. Um, my story, which I won't go into, but that whole bird story, remember the bird story? Was the same thing. God had started answering my prayer a year and a half before I prayed it. Because Nancy, if you remember, she had started working on the bird a year and a half earlier. I didn't know about it, but he started answering my prayer before I prayed. So when the time came that I prayed, the answer was there. Yeah. That's awesome. Let's see if we can squeeze in one more. So... I love the idea of that um, God is not just an audience to our prayer. He's a participant in our prayer. He's mm. a partner in our prayer. Mm. And this idea of uh, connecting the Bible to our prayer life and how God works together in this partnership with us. Talk a little bit about that. And I think we even have a resource that helps us with that. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Praying the Word. We say, okay, how do we pray the Word? Well, I talked a little about that, that... The more you know the Word, the more you know how to pray the will of God, because you see it in the Word. So praying Scripture, um, I've got a, a class, we may even have a little thing that we can put up here about a, a class called Deeper Devotions that's coming up June 10th, um, uh, where I, I talk about reading the Word, I call it reading with your ears so that you can hear God's voice in Scripture, and then the Scripture becomes the starting point of your conversation with, with God. It's how you... How you prayer, and, prayer and Bible reading are not two separate activities. They're two parts of a conversation. And you let God start the conversation by getting into the Word. So on, in that class on Deeper Devotions in June, um, and I've done it a few times, and we'll do it again then, um, I talk about how do you get into the Word, how do you read it, how do you hear Him, and how do you let God start that conversation so that prayer then becomes sort of an ongoing part of your life, but it's driven by what God was saying to you in the Scripture. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Kind of? Yes. Kind of? So, okay, good. So, <clears throat> I think we have time, Let's, if we can make one quick. So, sure. but, uh, we get this in class 201 a lot. How long should I pray? How long, you mean like how many minutes? Yeah, like how many, uh -huh. you know, to the second, how long should I pray? <laughs> well, like I always tell my kids, I know you'll do the right thing. Uh, you just, you, you, you pray as long as you pray. 
I remember, I, I, we read those scriptures that were in your notes. Uh, uh, that Paul said, look, I just mentioned you in my prayer. There are other times where you may actually pray for 25 minutes about something. Me personally, when it comes to how long to pray, I, I don't have the, um, the discipline or the focus to be one of those people who prays for an hour at a time. Some people do. They got it. They can do it. Glory to God. Go for it. I can't do that. My mind wanders. It's just, I'm a mess, okay? So what I do, um, I have a a few little habits that I've developed that I've talked to some of you about before. One of them I call first minutes. And what first minutes is, is the first minute when I get out of bed, the first minute when I'm in the car driving to work, the first minute when I arrive on campus and I'm walking down the hallway, the first minute when I walk in to sit in a meeting, It's those moments throughout the day when I just talk to God about what's going on. So I didn't pray about all of those things in the morning before I left the house when my mind is still asleep. And, you know, I'm praying about them throughout the day by just grabbing these little first minutes. What it does is it gives me a sense of continual conversation all day long with God. Where so many people live sort of a dualistic life where, okay, here's my God devotion life, and it's over here, and it takes these 30 minutes in the morning, and if I oversleep, well, okay, I didn't get them, I'll do them tomorrow. But instead, it weaves the whole thing together into an integrated life where all of life is lived with an awareness of God's presence, where these little moments of prayer throughout the day. The other thing I like to do is what I call turning self-talk into God talk. Raise your hand if you've never talked to yourself. <laughs> okay, you know what I'm talking about, right? So <clears throat> the problem with talking to yourself is if you think about all of the problems you've ever had, all of those relational conflicts, all those things you talk to yourself about, they all have one thing in common, you. <laughs> so talking to you about that isn't going to solve anything. So when I catch myself talking to myself, I just start talking to God. God. I turn my self-talk into God talk. I just think, I'm not going to answer this question. I'm not going to solve this problem. And I just begin to pray. And and I talk to myself a lot. So it's those kinds of things in in terms of how long do I pray. Sometimes it's just a sentence. Sometimes it's a few minutes. It's just whatever I feel like, okay, I'm I'm, I'm done. We've had the conversation and and I can move on. I don't think there's any magic number or, or time slot of how long you need to be praying. Yeah, that's great. That's helpful. So one last question. We're almost at I guess I won't. Is there any, uh, any books that have really been impactful for you uh, in terms of prayer? Uh, the Bible. Thank you. <laughs> the Bible. Actually, it really has. It really, really has helped my prayer life. The Knowing being in the Word of God has just made such a huge difference in how I talk with God. Um, uh, there's a, uh, oh gosh, what's the name of it? There's a, uh, there's a book by Jack Hayford called, called Prayer is Invading the Impossible. There's a classic work by E.M. Bounds on prayer that probably every pastor in America has got on a bookshelf. It's a great book, just a, a series of, of devotional articles he wrote about prayer. Big book, E.M. Bounds um, on prayer. Um, David Jeremiah. Fan. David Jeremiah. And I can't remember the name of his book on prayer. It's called Prayer, and then there's a colon, and it's a something. I can't remember what it's called. Like a wildlife or something? Or uh, d- a call to a, a wildlife? Or a, not a wildlife. I don't know. Oh. I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> Call of a wildlife. Those are my books. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, those are the Pentecostals. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. David Jeremiah, if you look it up, if you go to David Jeremiah, great preacher, down in San Diego. Incredible preacher. You probably heard him on the radio. What's that? Adventure. Adventure what? The Great Adventure. Prayer of the Great Adventure. The Excellent book. From David the Jeremiah. Thank you. Prayer of the Great Adventure by David Jeremiah. Yeah, all three of those. That, Ian Bounds, and Jack Hayford's book, uh, Prayer in Invading the Impossible. All right. 
We're going to wrap up. Can I ask you one last favor? Can you uh-huh. do a prayer blessing over uh, the people, not only in this room, but also the people at home watching online? Yeah. Um, can you just uh, bless their prayer life? Sure. Yes. Open your hands like you want to receive something, okay? By faith. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your kindness, for your faithfulness, for your grace, your generosity. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of prayer. Thank you for inviting us to talk to you. Thank you, Lord, that you want to hear from us and that you listen when we call. And so, Lord, on behalf of all the people that are gathered in this place and those who are watching online tonight or maybe into the future who are watching, I pray for the grace, the peace, and the blessing of Jesus Christ to rest on their homes, on their lives, their businesses, their relationships, Lord, would you bless your people with your grace and your mercy. I pray that you as the God of hope would fill us all with joy and peace as we trust in you so that we in turn may overflow with hope by the power of your spirit. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.